doesn't have a huge amount to do with um, taking fingerprints in police stations or anything like that. And it's quite a subtle problem to understand. Um, so I'll try to explain to you the problem that we're trying to solve, the problem of personal identity. Uh, number one, you are the same person you were 10 or 20 years ago. Number two, you are a very different person from the person you were 10 or 20 years ago. Now, there seems to be, in a sense, no contradiction between these two claims. Because number one is right, because you're the same one that you were 10 or 20 years ago. The same one, or the same something or other. The same human being, perhaps, or the same you, or the same consciousness, or the same soul, or the same person. You're the same something or other that you were 10 or 20 years ago. But the sense in which number two is right is completely different. You're a different sort of person or a different sort of human being from the one you were 10 or 20 years ago. You're uh, much larger, you're much heavier, you're probably much more knowledgeable, you live in a different place, you're involved in different activities. Now, the problem of personal identity is how it's possible for these two claims, one and two, to be true simultaneously. In a sense, you are, and in a sense, you are not the person you were in the past, or if you like, will be in the future. Now, to understand uh, the problem, we have to realize that the word same, S-A-M-E, in English, is ambiguous. On the one hand, same can mean same one. But on the other hand, secondly, the word same can mean same type or same sort or same kind. So, for example, somebody might say, oh, look, uh, this, uh, this BMW parked outside uh, Blackfriars is the same one that was parked here last week. Or someone might say, oh, look, these two uh, red jacks which are parked outside Blackfriars. This one is not this one, but they're of the same type. They're both Jaguars, they're both red, they're both parked outside Blackfriars. Now, this uh, distinction between same one and same kind tends to be assimilated or obliterated or telescoped together in ordinary thinking, at least in uh, English and probably in most Western natural languages. But we need to keep them sharply distinct to understand the problem of personal identity. Now, another way of setting up the problem is to ask, uh, what lasts if you last? What lasts if you last? Or what is it that's the same now in you as 10 or 20 years ago? Another way of setting up the problem is to ask the question, what changes if you change? What changes if you change? By change, I mean roughly gaining or shedding properties, uh, acquiring or losing characteristics. Well, what is it about you that gains or sheds characteristics as time goes on? Now, that's probably enough about the problem of personal identity to uh, motivate the uh, problem. I'll say that um, in logic... Um, in uh, logic, and sometimes in philosophy, there's a definition of identity which goes like this. For all x and for all y, x is identical with y, is numerically identical with y, or it's exactly the same thing as y, if and only if every property of x is a property of y, and every property of y is a property of x. In other words, two uh, prima facie distinct or purportedly, purportedly distinct objects will turn out to be, after all, one and the same object if and only if they share all and only each other's properties, right? Now, that's a definition of identity in logic, a definition of numerical identity. I don't think the... Uh, 
definition is absolutely faultless. We probably have to understand the notion of identity to understand the uh, notion of um, bi the biconditional, for example. But we'll leave that on one side and have this as a, as a, as a rough stat of what identity is. Now, the trouble is, a third or a fourth way of setting up the problem of personal identity is to say that your identity over time, your identity over time uh, violates this principle, which is known as Leibniz's law. All right. The, the, re the reason is, uh, that supposing X is U at an earlier time, and supposing Y is U at a later time, then there are properties that you have at one of these times that you don't have at the other, and vice versa. So it clearly violates Leibniz's law uh, to claim that there's personal identity over time, at least in a way that involves gaining or shedding, gaining or shedding uh, properties. Now, in a way, it's this violation of Leibniz's law that motivates that motivates the problem. Now, um, I suppose that's looking at the problem um, uh, logically. If you were to think in a, in a more um, existential vein, one could wonder about oneself or wonder about uh, one's own existence. Well, what is it about me uh, that has remained the same over time? Or what is it about me that uh, is or seems to be unchanging? And one might take the view, uh, or you might take the view about yourself, that there's something or other that's remained completely unchanging over time. Now, I'll say, I'll discuss three putative solutions to the problem of personal identity, or three broad approaches to answering this uh, question. Um, in the uh, literature. Actually, before I, before I do that, I'll, uh, I'll say that often the problem is posed in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. In other words, what are the necessary conditions for a person at a time being uh, numerically identical with a person at a later time, and what are the sufficient conditions for a person at an earlier time being identical with a person at a later time. By necessary conditions, I mean what has to be the case? What are the uh, prerequisites? What's got to be in place in order for it to be true that the, uh, that the later person is the earlier person? The intuitive idea of a necessary condition is that of a prerequisite or that without which not. By a sufficient condition is meant the set of properties which guarantees that the later person is the earlier person, or the properties such that if they're in place or if they're possessed, then the later person is the earlier person as a matter of logic. The notion, the notion of a necessary and a sufficient condition are interrelated in various interesting ways, depending on where your interests lie, I suppose. Um, but um, the well, I mean, plausibly, if everything uh, necessary is in place, uh, then that's sufficient for uh, identity, right? Or the sufficient condition is just the set of all the necessary uh, conditions. Now, the three putative solutions to the problem that I'll talk about are, first of all, the spatio-temporal continuity of the body, Secondly, the memory criterion. And thirdly, the existence of the soul. Uh, probably no prizes now for guessing which one's going to turn out to be the correct theory. But <laughs> ne never mind. Uh, now, <laughs> now, the uh, spatio-temporal continuity of the body theory or criterion or alleged solution to the problem goes like this. Um, A, human, a living human body uh, exists over time from T1 to T2, where T2 is later than T1. And 
the existence of a particular human body is a necessary for your personal identity over time and b sufficient for your personal identity over time in other words to talk about uh, a later person being identical with an earlier person is to talk about a human body having lasted from the earlier time to the later time. Or there is a space-time route from the earlier time to the later time that's occupied by one and only one living human body. Uh, or there is a space-time sausage which is a human body strung out over time from the earlier time to the later time. And to talk about an earlier person being identical with a later person is to talk about two slices being slices of the same space-time sausage. <laughs> now, uh, so there are two components to this thesis. The spatio-temporal continuity of the body is sufficient for personal identity. And secondly, it's necessary for identity. Now, I'll try and cast some doubt on these two claims. It seems to me uh, not logically or theoretically impossible that one and the same body over time should be occupied by different consciousnesses or that the subjective point of view or owner of the subjective point of view should change over time, but the body remain one and the same or continuous over time. Now this might seem rather fanciful, but um, as I say, it's theoretically possible and it's logically impossible in the sense that it seems to entail no contradiction. It might become technologically possible to, so to speak, graft successive consciousnesses on one and the same human body over time. There might be uh, institutes working on this at this moment, for all I know. Thirdly, from uh, the point of view of astral yoga or southern Colorado mysticism, it's possible to leave your body anyway and jump into the body of tourists who are unfortunate enough to be visiting pyramids in Mexico and uh, occupy, their, occupy their bodies, occupy their subjective point of view. Apparently it's very frightening for the tourists, according to the reports in southern Colorado. Now, whether this actually happens or not, it looks theoretically possible. And if we've got something that's theoretically possible, and we say, oh, well, no, that, that's not going to happen, that's not going to happen, bear in mind we're only in 2012, and if things still exist in a million years' time, or 30 million years' time, they might actually, these things might actually come about. In fact, they might come about in about 50 years' time. Uh, now, the theoretical possibility of that shows that the continuity of the body over time is not sufficient for personal identity, or it's not logically sufficient, it's not logically conclusive. Now, turning to whether spatio-temporal continuity is a necessary condition for the identity of the person over time, I'm inclined to say it's not, um, because uh, to, to understand this, we want to make, we want to make the supposition that the spatio-temporal continuity of the body is broken. Uh, normally, the spatio-temporal continuity of the body is not broken. But supposing uh, one day Priest was trying to explain these things in the aula in uh, Blackfriars, <coughs> but he disappeared for, uh, say, five minutes. <coughs> now, supposing he hadn't uh, gone behind the blackboard, <laughs> but supposing he'd ceased to exist for five minutes and cease to speak. No. But then but then he then he reappeared. We'd say, well, this is this must be some trick, some trapdoor or 
as some absent-minded colleagues are known to do, is walk into the broom cupboard when he thought he was leaving the lecture theatre, this sort of thing. But no, let's suppose, just for sake of argument, that he ceased to exist for five minutes. For five minutes. Um, we can raise, we can offer different permutations. Has, has the whole human being ceased to exist? Has just the body ceased to exist? Has the consciousness can continue this sort of thing? But let's suppose the, the whole human being has ceased to exist for five minutes. Now, supposing after the five minutes non-existence is over, uh, this just carries on. So, well, where was I? Oh, yes, that's right. Um, I tried to explain the problem of uh, personal identity. Now, we, we, now, we're suddenly presented with a choice. We say, um, not choice number one is, well, um, it's clearly uh, still priest. It's still priest. Um, he, he looks the same. He's still talking about the same old stuff. Uh, it's obviously uh, him, right? Uh, but the spatio-temporal continuity of his body was uh, broken. Therefore, we give up that theory of uh, personal identity. In particular, we give up the component which says that the continuity of the body is a necessary condition or a prerequisite or that without which not. Okay? That's, that's one option that we've got. But the other option is to say, well, it looks like priest, it sounds like a, a priest, uh, but it can't possibly be him. It's definitely not him because the spatio-temporal continuity of the body has been uh, broken. And that's what personal identity consists in. So this situation presents us with a, with a conceptual choice. Uh, now, we could think there are reasons for jumping one way or the other. You might say, well, look, it is a priest. It's just something very strange has happened. He's been um, working with some dubious organization which enables him to disappear from for five minutes. I'm not surprised. The military probably been working on this uh, for, year, for years. Right? That, that's one possibility. Uh, so we're inclined to say, well, that's the end of, end of the story. Space and temporal identity criteria was, was, was false. Uh, it turns out that a person can exist intermittently, rather like a headache. A person can come and go. A person can exist, perhaps too much. Uh, a person can come and go. Uh, now, we might think that's, that's quite plausible, but supposing uh, two Stephen Priests in quotation marks came out, suppose two came back, so, and they all look the same, they're, they're all speaking like this. Supposing six uh, came back, supposing 500 million uh, <laughs> came back, perhaps we'd have to talk, we'd have to give up about talk, talking about coming back uh, now, because we'd be, I think, far less inclined to say that it's still priest. We don't know whether uh, priest is one or none of the 500 million who exist after the uh, five minutes break. Uh, we don't know whether it makes sense to say that one person can bifurcate into 500, well, bifurcate implies two, more than bifurcate, multiplicate, multicate. Into, into 500 uh, million. Could they all be identical with me? Could none of them be identical with me? Could some of them be identical with me? Well, anyway, we, we don't know the answers to these questions. In a way, we'd have to make stipulative uh, conceptual choices or decisions. But these thought experiments are sufficient to refute the um, spatio-temporal continuity of the body as uh, uh, logical solutions to the problem of personal identity. Uh, yeah. um, th there's, a, there's another problem about, there's a problem about formulating the spatio-temporal continuity um, solution. If we say the continuity of a body is necessary and sufficient for my identity, that looks implausible because we need to know well, which body, you know, just any uh, body. Right? But if we say the spatio-temporal continuity of my body is necessary and sufficient for 
personal identity. In a way, that looks tautological, or at least it looks sufficient for personal identity, because we've got my, the idea of my in there, my body. Now, I'll say something next about the memory criterion. Now, on the memory criterion, there are two, well, there are two versions. Number one, the later person being the earlier person consists in their remembering the earlier person. And the second version <coughs> is the later person being the earlier person is their remembering being the earlier person. Now, if you look at the first of these, the later person being the earlier person consists in their remembering the earlier person. That looks straightforwardly false. Anthony Flew, F-L-E-W, who's dead now, um, used to say, well, I remember my brother joining the army, uh, therefore I'm my brother, looks fallacious. Now, Flew's right about that. The, the, the bare fact, the bare stark fact that the later person remembers the earlier person doesn't give us the later person <laughs> is the earlier person. Right. So, if we turn to the other version, the later person remembers being the earlier person, therefore the later person is the earlier person. This seems extremely uh, plausible in the sense that if you remember being someone and you remember veridically, if your remembering is accurate and right, accurately enough to secure reference to the earlier person, that it follows as a matter of logic that you are the earlier person. You are the earlier person. If you remember being X, then you are X, if you remember correctly. Um, but this view looks hopelessly circular. As Bishop Butler says, memory presupposes personal identity. It doesn't explain it. Because in this definition, you see, we've incorporated the concept of being X or being someone or being the earlier person. That makes the definition vacuously circular. Besides, we don't want to make it a necessary condition. We don't want to make it a necessary condition for the later person remembering the earlier person in order to be the earlier person. I mean, the reason for this is that there must be huge tracts of your life that you don't remember. I mean, some of us more than others, I suppose. But uh, there must be periods of your life that you don't remember. But you were still you during those uh, periods. So we don't want to make remembering a period of your life a necessary condition for it being a period of your life. So this uh, memory criteria at this point is too, is too strong a requirement on personal identity. Personal identity obtains whether we remember it or not, it seems. Now, having said all that in criticism of the memory uh, uh, criterion, there, there does seem a certain oddness in maintaining that I can be the person who I was, but have no memory at all of being the person who I was. There's a certain oddness uh, in that. But that might not be because um, memory is constitutive of personal identity per se. It might be that memory is constitutive of being a person, and derivatively, so to speak, uh, constitutive of being of, of, personal, of personal identity. It might be that only beings that have memories can be people, and it's only in that sense that it's necessary for personal identity. It doesn't, of itself, guarantee identity all <coughs> the time. Now,
Now, I've mentioned these two theories of um, personal identity. In a way, it's possible to combine them. It's possible to say that memory uh, constitutes psychological continuity. It might not be necessary for psychological continuity in an austere sense, one thought or experience follows another in a way that's continuous, a, a, a stream of consciousness. Uh, but it might be that memory unifies a stream of consciousness as one's own uh, stream of consciousness. There's psychological continuity. Secondly, um, despite my thought experiment, there is continuity of the human body. There's psychological continuity and there is um, physical continuity. Now, if we put these two points together, then a human being or a human person is a space-time process. A human being is a space-time process. Now, if we go back to the problem of personal identity, we can say, well, look, um, what makes the later person numerically identical with the earlier person is there being parts or uh, components of one and the same space-time process or psychophysical space-time process. So um, the whole person or, the, or, or the, the person as a whole who you are is a psychophysical process that lasts from birth to death. And when we ask for the identity of the person, we're asking far too much if we want a later phase of this process to be numerically identical with an earlier phase of this process. There's no such thing as that, or normally there's no such thing as that. Um, now, on this view then, you are a space-time sausage, and I am a space-time sausage, or you are a sausage strung out over space-time. And uh, at this moment, you are a slice of the space-time sausage, and you're wondering what, it can, what your relationship is to an earlier slice of the space-time sausage. But in fact, the identity of the person consists simply in the existence of the entire space-time process. Now, I think this view is worthy of great respect. There's great plausibility in this view. And something like the continuity of the human being can be explained in terms of it. But there's something that's missing from the picture on my view. And that is, at any time, at any time between birth and death, you are wholly present. You are wholly present, or you're completely present. Now, I don't mean that all the uh, slices of the space-time process are simultaneous. They're not. They're successive. But there's a sense in which when you exist at a time, it's wholly and completely you who exists at this time. You're not lacking anything by existing at a time. Of course, we could, take, we could take the view that the previous phases of you still exist or have now passed or future phases are yet to come or, uh, or, or do not have any sort of uh, even potential ontological status. We take different views about that. But there's, there's a sense of you or a sense of now in which you're completely here now or completely present. And no justice is done to this whatsoever on the um, space-time process view. Now, I think that these two theories, or three if you combine them, but these two theories are flawed because they are empirical theories and the empirical entails change, entails change, and so Leibniz's law is still violated. In other words, on my view, on these theories that we've looked at, it does not come out as explained, or it does not come out as true, that the later person is identical 
with the earlier person. It doesn't come out as true that the later person is identical with the earlier person. It comes out at best that the later person is continuous with the earlier person. Continuous with the earlier person. Now, some philosophers have noticed this, notably um, Derek Parfit in All Souls here, uh, and uh, David Hume, the 18th century Scottish philosopher, and if I read them rightly, certain Buddhist thinkers take the view that there is no personal identity. There is no personal identity. There's only continuity. There's only personal continuity. So the whole question, or the whole problem from the outset, rested on a false assumption, and that is that you are identical now with an earlier person or an earlier uh, something. No, you are continuous now with an earlier person. Now, I think that this view, I can understand why Parfit, Hume, and the Buddhists have adopted this view. It's because they've noticed the failure <coughs> of solutions to the problem of personal identity. But I think, nonetheless, that there is a sense in which you know that you're identical with the person who was alive 5, 10, 15 years ago. You know that in some sense of the same, you're the same one, despite the radical changes in size and weight and psychology and view and uh, attitude. There's something that remains absolutely the same or something that's unchanging. Now, the problem, I think, is that Leibniz's law is incompatible with change. Leibniz's law is incompatible with change. And all the theories of personal identity, except the next one, uh, tend to presuppose uh, change, or essentially presuppose uh, change. Now, um, So the, the, the reason why change is incompatible with personal identity or incompatible with what personal identity consists in at a pr profound level is that um, change is the gaining and shedding of properties. And Leibniz's law says that uh, if two things differ in properties, they can't be the same thing. They can't turn out to be one and the same. Uh, thing. That's why change is incompatible with personal identity at a profound uh, level. Now, it follows, I think, that there's something about you that is unchanging. There's something in your nature or about you that is unchanging. Or put it this way, um, we could make the following two claims. We don't know what it is, right? But we could make the following two claims. Number one, it changes. Number two, it does not change. It does not change. It changes. It does not change. Now, we have to understand that there's a sense in which there's no contradiction between these two claims. Whatever it is changes, or it changes, or number one is true, because, of course, you gain and shed properties over time. Right? You gain and lose weight, or gain and lose hair, or, or you think these thoughts rather than those uh, thoughts. So it changes. But the second one, it does not change. At some level, the subject of change does not change, or that which is the subject of change does not change or whatever it is about you or in you that does not, that does change, qua or as subject of change, is unchanging. Now we need to know what that is. Uh, Hume, in a very famous uh, passage about personal identity, says that whenever he um, introspects, 
he finds no impression of self, no single impression of self that could give rise to the idea of self. He always happens upon some sensation or other. And on this basis, Hume concludes that mankind is a bundle of perceptions. Now, this passage in Hume must be, at the same time, the most influential and the least perceptive passage in Western philosophy. There can be no piece of writing which is at one and the same time so enormously successful in its influence and so naive and grotesquely mistaken <laughs> in its uh, claims. I mean, who thought that they were going to, to be a sensation in their own mind? A anyone. Right? Who thought that they were going to be an object of their own uh, introspection, this sensation or that? Uh, sensation. Who thought this anyway? Now, um, in spite of Hume, or I'd say the following are clearly permanent aspects of your own existence, or permanent or unchanging components of you. Firstly, uh, now. It's always now. Or it is unchangingly now. Now, if I say it's unchangingly now, one's inclined to say, well, that's not right uh, at all. Um, it's hardly now for any time at all. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> the, 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 there is no now. The, the future becomes past, uh, but there is no now. Or we're inclined to say, well, the now is unchanging, or the now is permanent. What about these sounds and shapes and colours? They're coming and going. Uh, all, all the time. Now, there are different, there are different uh, senses of now, or different layers of now. The content, or what goes on now, of course does change, arguably is perpetually uh, changing. Okay? The content of the now is perpetually replacing itself phenomenologically. Okay? It changes all, all the time. And of course, the future is becoming the past, and the becoming past of the future is the now, or the transition uh, through the now. But having acknowledged both those truths, or both those phenomenological observations, we should notice a third, and that is that it's always now, or it's still now, or it's still now now, for example, or it's never not now, or the future, uh, in a way, never arrives, because by definition the future is not yet. The past is never now, because the past by definition is over. I say by definition, but language does not have as much power as many philosophers think in this respect. Now, now uh, means when I am. Now means when I am. So if the now is permanent in this phenomenological way that I've just described, you as the now or in the now, or as part of the now, are permanent. That's not to say that the human being that you are is permanent. It might be all too transient. That there's an unchanging now, uh, which, you can, which you can introspect. Uh, secondly, there's a property of you-ness, or a property of being you, which I was trying to talk about last uh, week. There's a property of being you, of being uniquely uh, you, and nobody else. I don't know what this property is, whether it's a tone or a feeling or an aspect or something uh, completely inscrutable, but it's phenomenologically given. And uh, it's not straightforwardly mental, and it's not straightforwardly physical, uh, but this you-ness of you, or this being you, or perhaps the feeling of being you, uh, has been with you as long as you've existed, or at least as long as you've been conscious. Thirdly, uh, Hume misses what I call absolute interiority. Now, the idea of absolute interiority I borrow from, uh, from phenomenology, from uh, the early work of Jean-Paul Sartre in the transcendence of the ego, and in a way, uh, Husserl, who influences him very strongly. Now, by absolute interiority, I mean an inside without an outside, 
an inside without an outside. Now, I think the phenomenological space of your own consciousness is an absolute interiority, or an inside without an outside. And this interiority uh, characterizes your own existence. It characterizes it unchangingly. It is the inner space within which your own experiences happen, where, in which you live your own uh, life. To get a grip on the notion of absolute interiority, I like to contrast it with the idea of a surface, because it seems to me a surface for a physical object is an outside without an inside, or a surface is pure exteriority. Um, you couldn't peel the surface off this um, table the way you could peel its um, 1960s veneer uh, off, off it. Now, um, no, well, the, there are other ways in which we could describe the unchanging. I think that uh, in, in um, the 1927 book, Being and Time, when Heidegger talks about the disclosure of being to being, uh, whether he intends to say this or not, he's describing what is unchanging in your own existence. Of course, Heidegger thinks that your existence is thrownness into the world. He thinks your existence involves being in the world. He thinks your existence involves uh, exceeding yourself or ex uh, instance or um, existing into the future in a way that's projected into the future. But nonetheless, there is a lichtung or a clearing or a zone in the Black Forest. You have to write lichtung with a capital L because the Germans spell all their nouns with a capital letters, you might know. Okay. Uh, th there's a site of disclosure of being, which is your own existence. Um, Heidegger intends these claims at the level of fundamental ontology, at the level of being rather than beings, or the level of... Uh, uh, the being of what is, rather than simply uh, what is. Now, now, Hume has no idea about anything like that. Um, or, if you don't like Heidegger, he's becoming less and less popular because of various notebooks that have emerged. Um, <laughs> uh, if we look at Husserl instead, if you look at Husserl, Edmund Husserl's 1913 book, Ideas, Husserl has a phenomenological tactic which he calls epoche, which is uh, a Greek term that means suspension of belief. It was used by certain Greek skeptics. Now, the epoche is a methodological device for suspending belief in the outside world or the objective uh, world. Husserl accepts that there's an external world. It's a methodological device only in order to do phenomenology, in, in order to reduce what is to the appearance of what is, in order to reduce objects to phenomena. But as a result of the epoch, one's own existence is disclosed as pure consciousness or pure transcendental consciousness. Transcendental means necessary for the world or necessary for uh, experience. We use the term in a quasi-Kantian way. So the epoch discloses one's own existence as pure consciousness, or in some Husserl books, uh, the transcendental ego, a kind of subject of one's experience, which is never, never object. Um, so, I mean, I'm inclined to say that there is something that has remained wholly unchanging about your own existence. It, it's what your existence consists in, as opposed to the existence of the human being that you're closely associated with. It's uh, now, um, it's saturated with you -ness. it exhibits absolute interiority or inner space. It's a kind of pure consciousness revealed by the epoche, and it's a zone in which uh, being is revealed to being. I'd say that um, the, the findings of phenomenologists and mystics, in a way, are revealing the unconditioned, or your own existence at an unconditioned level rather than a conditioned level. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Now, I suggest that it's this that is the unchanging subject of change. It's this that remains the same uh, throughout your existence. And this is not something mental, and it's not something physical. It's what your existence consists in. It's permanent. It exists at least as long as uh, you exist. Uh, for these reasons, it has the same features as uh, the soul. And if it has the same features as the soul, then it is the soul. Right, let's break for 10 minutes or so and uh, reconvene for the death part. Oh.